What's up guys, Michael from Paragon. Welcome to the channel. Today I wanted to kick off a video series, the tech series or inside the gearbox series. And today I wanna to talk to you guys about gearbox shimming and gear shimming and what I do to make my gun sound perfect. All right, so what is shimming and why do we wanna do it? Shimming is when we alter the space between each gear to give each gear maximum or optimal tooth contact. And the reason why we wanna do this is to prolong the life of our gear set, as well as improve overall performance of the gearbox itself. This also results in a much cleaner and crisper sound when the gearbox cycles. Now that we know why it's important and why we wanna do it, well, how do we do it? Well, before we dive in, let's go over some necessary tools that you'll need to get started. The most important tool for getting accurate shimming every single time is going to be a micrometer or a digital caliper like you see here. So this one is made by Mitsutoyo. Uh, the reason why I went with this specific one is that it's very, very accurate. The accuracy of the caliper is very important for measuring the shims as well as measuring the gear space. The next important piece is getting a precise or precision shim kit like this one from Rocket Airsoft. This is what I use in all of my builds here at Paragon. And the reason why I like these is they come in 0 0.1, 0 0.15, and 0 0.20 increments. This really allows me to fine tune the height of each gear. Another component that's optional is some type of aluminum tape or metal tape. Um, this is beneficial for motor towers that are very, very small or undersized. We'll go more in depth throughout the video on why um, motor, towering, motor tower shimming is important. But let me just show you what I have here. This is by 3M. I think this is like HVAC, uh, some type of HVAC tape. I don't know exactly the name, but it's on Amazon. Um, it's really thin and you would basically just roll this around the motor tower and this provides a snug fit between the motor tower and the gearbox shell. Another important piece is the motor grip itself. And in some cases, if you're looking at different types of gearboxes, maybe like a version three or something like that, where it doesn't use the motor grip to align the motor, then you can disregard this part. Uh, but for V2 or M4 style builds like the most of us are doing, having a proper motor grip is very, very important for motor alignment. So this is why I choose PTS EPG C motor grips. And I go with the C because it doesn't have the back strap because sometimes on specific receivers, the back strap can throw off the fitment or the alignment of the motor grip. And not only are we being cautious of the fitment between the gears in terms of height, but also the alignment of the motor itself. So. When something is misaligned, our shimming could be done properly, but because the motor is lined, you're getting excessive wear, and this excessive wear causes high-pitched noises, and nobody wants uh, a whiny sounding gearbox. Now that we've gone over some of the important components needed for a gearbox shimming, let's head over to the tech bench and get into how we actually shim the gearbox. All right, so now we're at the tech bench, and the first part to the shimming isn't the bevel to pinion like most people think. Um, well, it is the first gear that we shim, but the first thing that we need to check is actually the motor tower shaft diameter. And why this is important is because some motor shafts are about 9 mils, 9.2 mils, or in this case, this T238 brushless motor is 9.5 mils. And why is this important? Well, when we measure the opening, on this gearbox shell, this one's a retro arms gearbox shell. So this opening right here, I've measured this countless times, it's anywhere from 9.9 .9 to 10 millimeters. Um, that leaves space. And what that space will do is let's say we're looking at the motor in this space, right? What's gonna happen is the motor will dip down. Let's say this is the, the bevel gear and this is all assembled. Well, we're just gonna pretend. Okay, now these opposing forces, they wanna separate from each other. And when there's that space there in the gearbox, you can hear it and you can see that it's free to move. This will throw things out of alignment. And one thing that I found from watching the existing tutorials or videos that are available right now in, in gearbox shimming, I don't think there's anyone that, that has mentioned this before and this is a critical component and this is where the aluminum foil tape comes into play because you're going to wrap it around the shaft to match 
the diameter of your gearbox. Now, in some cases, you don't need to do this because the motor tower shaft and the gearbox are, are going to have similar tolerances or some similar specifications. But when you start upgrading things, you know, tolerances start to stack and we need to uh, make up for those tolerances, in this case with the aluminum tape. For the sake of the video, I'm not gonna go ahead and tape this on camera. We're gonna pretend that this is now matching. Uh, we wanna leave some space. It's not gonna be perfectly 10 millimeters to go inside of this. Uh, we understand that there needs to be some, some space in order for the, uh, the motor tower shaft to be inserted. So you can aim for 9.8 or 9.9 mils if you're using a virtual arms gearbox or sometimes even a little bit less. It doesn't need to be perfect, guys. It just needs to eliminate most of the space. Moving on. So after we shimmed our motor tower, again, we're gonna pretend that I just wrapped a bunch of tape around this. The next step is actually setting the motor height. To set the motor height, we're gonna take one half of the gearbox shell with the bevel gear. So we're gonna take the, we're gonna refer to this as the top half, this as the bottom half here. So we're gonna take the top half, Drop in the bevel gear. We're gonna take a motor grip screw, your motor grip of choice. And you wanna snug it up. You don't need to go crazy and over torque it, but just snug it up so that way there's no movement in the grip. We're gonna take our motor, and I like to orient it the same way the wires would come out. Uh, what I mean by that is the um, positive terminal is going to be facing down here. So just like that. You don't have to, it's just a little OCD thing of mine. I'm gonna drop that in. Take our trusty little screwdriver. and we're gonna turn the motor adjustment screw down here to where the bottom edge of the bevel gear is perpendicular with the bottom edge of the pinion gear. So in this case, I've actually already got it set and it might be hard to focus in on the camera, but you wanna look at it from different angles. Now, in my experience, it's better to be in the era of being lower and not over inserting the motor itself. Let me go ahead and show you guys what that looks like outside of everything. So this outer diameter here is what I'm calling the bottom and the bottom of the pinion is down here or the, the widest part. And basically you want these two surfaces to be perpendicular with each other. And like I said, it's okay if it's slightly lower. I would, I would not recommend going higher um, just because in certain cases with certain pinion gears, they don't have these deep gutters and it's just gonna mess everything up. So just trust me on that guys. But that is what it should look like right there. Okay, so now that we got a good idea of what the proper motor height looks like, now we're gonna adjust the play between the bevel gear and the pinion gear, or in this case, the height. So this is where the caliper comes into play because we're gonna use it like a depth gauge. So we're gonna take the bevel gear and we're gonna install both sides of the shell. And very important to actually install screws to apply tension on the gearbox. Just because without the screws, the gearbox may not be applying the proper force or clamping down on the gear properly. So this just ensures that we're applying the same force as if the gearbox were completely closed. Now we don't need to do, again, all of the screws. I find that four in the cross pattern to work enough. So now we got the gearbox tightened down and we can hear there's up and down play and we're going to eliminate that by the end. But first we want to determine how much height there is between the pinion gear here 
and the bevel gear here. We're going to take our gearbox and our motor grip, make sure that's snugged up all the way, and the motor grip screw again, just to make sure that the grip is properly attached to the gearbox shell. All right, so once we have that contraption, making sure that there's no play here, we're gonna drop in our motor again, just like before. Motor base plate. Also guys, I highly recommend these little iFixit kits. They're intended for computers, but they have a lot of the same bits that you would need for working on a gearbox and being able to switch out the tips uh, rapidly just makes working on everything else just a breeze. So what we're going to want to do is measure the height or the play between the two gears. And how do we do that? Well, we're just going to set this down. I like to take a little metal piece here. I used to use this for removing Daniel Defense barrel nuts on the VFCs. And I just use that to brace my caliper on just like this. And to kind of show you what we're going to be doing, is the bottom part of the caliper has a depth gauge. And we're gonna be using that to determine the play between the two gears. So we're gonna make sure our micrometer is on. And what we're gonna be doing is once we set it here and make sure that our platform is rock solid like this, make, making sure that there's no play, we're gonna zero out, so on this Caliper, there's a zero option. We're going to zero it. And when you zero it, guys, you don't want to take it off of the platform. You just want to keep it on. I'm just doing it for the video. Um, so once we zero that out, you can take a small screwdriver, or in my case, a small punch, and I'm going to lift the bevel gear. And that's going to tell me how much play there is between the bevel gear and the pinion gear. So in this case, it's saying that I have... 0.73 mils of space. Now, I like to take several measurements just to make sure. And this is specifically important for D-type pinion gears or non-CNC pinion gears uh, because they tend to be non-concentric. And what I mean by that is they're not perfect in shape. So one tooth could be 0.1 millimeters higher than the other tooth and that will throw off your readings here. But in this case, I'm using a Siege Tech bevel gear and a Siege Tech pinion gear, which both have phenomenal tolerances. So I technically wouldn't need to, but it's still a best practice to take a screwdriver or a punch and just go through the gears. And this is more of a feel thing. And you wanna feel if there's any part in this rotation here as we go through each tooth if one part feels tighter or um, closer together than the others. Basically, we're, we're finding or we're feeling for if something isn't concentric. And that's the part where we want to measure from. So I'm just going to go through each tooth and see if one has less play than the others. So they all feel about the same so far. And again, if you're using a quality CNC type pinion, it should be perfectly concentric. So the first reading is usually pretty accurate, but we always want to double check these things. Okay. So I'm going to lay down this little piece here to brace my caliper, place it down. Oh, and guys, if you can't see, I should probably zoom in. The bearing or bushing, you could see the gear axle come through. That's where you wanna insert the depth gauge, the smallest part here. So through that axle hole, okay? So that's how we're measuring the, the vertical play. All right. So set that up again, make sure it's braced, there's no movement, hit the zero, grab another punch because I just dropped it somewhere, okay, 
Okay. So, just like you saw before, guys, uh, 0.75 mils of space between. And that doesn't mean we're going to add 0.75 mils of shims because at that point it would be binding and actually applying outward pressure uh, on the bearings. And that's bad. We don't want to do that. We want to leave some space. And in my experience with the setups that I do, and this isn't going to apply to all setups, uh, but I typically leave about 0.1 mils of space. So in this case, I'll shim um, 0 0.6 to 0.65 and I'll double check the play make sure there's nothing binding uh, and that should be just about perfect. So we have some shims over here and we know that the copper ones from Rocket are 0.15 and we know that there's two silver ones. One is 0.1, the other is 0.2 and most of us can tell by feel which one's thicker and which one's thinner. Now what we don't want to assume that those numbers are entirely accurate because most of the time they're not. Sometimes the 0.2 could be 0 0.22, 0 0.23, sometimes 0.24. So what we really need to do is measure each shim in order to add up to that number that we determine we're going to add to the top of the bevel gear. So the play again was 0.75. I'm going to go with 0.6, go from there, and see what the fitment is like. So we're going to move this to the side just for now. And I'm going to take shims. So I could tell by looking at it, that one's a 0.2, this one's a 0.2, and then I'm going to take a 0.15. And I'll tell you what I mean. Another thing too, guys, is that shims sometimes aren't perfectly flat, and the tolerances will stack on each other. So if you do a 0.2, a 0.2, in this case a 0.15, in most cases it's not going to be a 0.55. So I'll show you what I mean. So we're going to combine all the shims together, make sure that they're flat, turn the caliper back on, zero it out, and we're going to measure these shims. Now before I have the reading, go ahead and go down in the comment sections and let me know what you think these uh, three shims are going to total out to. Okay, so moment of truth. Would you look at that? 0.61. Okay, so that's 0.6, or we'll say margin of error, 0.5 more than if we were just to, you know, not measure the, the shims at all. So don't get thrown off, guys. Measure the shims, especially on top of one another, to get the appropriate measurement. Okay, so now that we've got that measured out, I'm going to go ahead and add that to the top of the bevel gear. So we just jumped forward, I disassembled the little contraption that I had earlier measuring the depth or the uh, vertical play. So we're going to take those three shims and we're going to put it on top here, just like that. Okay, so this is what I'm referring to as the top of the bevel gear. And same thing, we're going to put our shell on top, take our four screws, and we're going to tighten everything down. All right, gearbox is tightened down. Now it's time for the motor grip. And yes, with screw every single time when we're checking this kind of stuff, guys. And also a quick tip when you're tightening any type of fastener, what I like to do is go counterclockwise first. You'll feel the fastener click in, and that's when you go clockwise to tighten the fastener. And this just prevents you cross-threading anything. So just a little quick tip there. Now we're going to take our motor, drop in our motor, take the motor grip base plate, and tighten it down. Okay, so we're going to do a feel check and we're going to see if there's play between the pinion teeth and the bevel teeth. Now, there's just a very, very tiny amount, guys. And in this case, it's a little too tight for my liking. So what I'm gonna do, you can hear a tiny bit of play. Like it's super tiny. Um, 
In this case, guys, if it's a little too tight, go in 0 .1, 0 0.1 or 0 0.5 if you can. In this case, I can. 0 0.1 to 0 0.5, I'm sorry, not 0 0.5, 0 0.05 increments, guys, uh, until you just have the tiniest amount of play. Again, you don't want anything binding up because when it binds, it's mashing together and that's not good. We still want a little bit of play there. So I'm going to go ahead and just fine tune this and it should be good to go. All right, guys, so we're back now. I swapped out that one copper shim, which is a 0.15. And I swapped it out for a silver shim, which is a 0.1. So it should be approximately that 0 0.05 that we're looking for. And another quick test that you could do is when you shake the gearbox, you can actually hear that, that tiny little bit of play and that's the gears um, hitting each other. And that's usually a good sign when there's very, very minimal. And that already tells me that the two gears aren't binding on each other. And when I come, take my punch or screwdriver and I check the play, very minimal guys. And this is what we're looking for is we want to minimize the play as much as possible, but before it's too tight and there's no movement, in which case the two are binding on each other. Now, when we measure it, some may be asking, well, it measured 0.75 or negative 0.75, right? So doesn't that mean that there's that much space? Well, yes and no. And the other thing that we have to factor is the bushing or bearing type, in this case, I'm using Peridot Armory J cage bearings, and these themselves have slack in them or tolerance or play in them, meaning that they can move within the race or the, the flanges or what, whatever the technical terminology you wanna use. There's basically play. So as we lift the gear up, it can actually go past a certain point and throw off the reading a little bit. So it's something that we have to take into consideration. Sometimes that that tolerance can be 0 0.1, 0 0.05. Um, so it's okay guys, when you take that first reading, if you don't get it right on the first time, uh, I hardly get it right on the first time. It usually takes me that second little fine tuning of removing that 0 0.1 to 0 0.05 mm's of a shim to get that play just right. So as you can see here, guys, perfect. That's exactly what we're looking for. So now once we've set the motor height properly, now we've got the pinion and bevel height done or the gear lash, right? Now we wanna shim the rest of the space because if we remove the motor, there's gonna be up and down play and I'll show you what that looks like. All right, so now the motor and the motor grip are removed. We can hear and we can see if we move the gear that there is play, okay? And you wanna visually inspect this and now that I've been doing this for so long, I have a laser calibrated eyeball and I can see that this is approximately, we'll start with a 0.15 and go from there and see if that eliminates most of the space. Uh, but this part I do by feel, it's just for me faster. If you're not comfortable, you can use the same uh, depth gauge method to measure out whatever remaining play is there. Uh, with bearings, I do leave some slack. Guys, I'm not making sure that there's no play. I leave about 0 0.05 mm's of, of play just to make sure it's not exuding outward pressure on the bearings because that's really bad and that's what can cause a bearing to blow. So we want to make sure that we're not exerting that excess pressure. So. We're gonna go ahead and add that 0.15 shim to the bottom of the bevel. So again, it's super nice with the rockets because it's color coded. Okay, so we got that 0.5 or 0.15, sorry, on there. Drop that down. And I'm just gonna do a check. So what I'm doing here is I'm trying to move the gear with my finger and seeing if without these screws, if it's binding already. And in this case, it's not. So I'm gonna tighten it just to double check. And the reason why I check without the screws first, guys, is it's just a quick check. Because sometimes if I do like a 0.2, for example, and I can already feel it binding, then I don't need to tighten down the screws to check. I already know it's binding without them. So 
I'm going to start with a smaller or thinner shin. But in this case, it seemed like enough play. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but there's like the tiniest click. Usually I like to shake it a little bit. I know it's kind of odd, you probably don't see other technicians doing this, but like shaking to see if there's a, that little bit of play. Um, and what some people do too is they'll go from the axle and push up with a punch or something. But in this case, I think I don't like that. Um, that 0.15 was a little too snug. So now if we drop down to that 0.1, it should be perfectly fine. Okay, and I could tell by feel this is a 0.1, but if you don't have as much experience, definitely break out the caliper and go ahead and measure that. Again, we're just gonna check. Okay, so I could feel there's a little bit of extra play, and that should just be about perfect. Yeah, that's better. So there's just that tiny little bit of play, and you can see that it's free spinning. I can't really get a good grip on it, but... And that's what we want, guys. So there's just that tiny, tiny amount Again, you can check whichever way you prefer, through here, through there, just to make sure there's that little bit of play and that there's no resistance. You could test it by spinning the gear as well, just like that, just to make sure it's not too tight. Very, very critical, especially on bearings like this. Okay, so how do we shim the rest of the gear? Well, the next gear is the step gear. And the way that the Siege Tech gears are designed are actually pretty neat. So because we used a 0.1 on the bottom of the bevel gear, we can go ahead and use that into shimming the step gear. And what I mean by that is I know that I want 0.1 mm of a gap between the two gears. We don't want the shims on the bottom of each gear to be the same because then it's going to bind but I just want the surface about 0.1 mm higher to give clearance for the gear surfaces not to rub on each other. And 0.1 in my experience has been extremely reliable and it results in a very smooth cycling gearbox. So your results may vary. You may need to find something that's the sweet spot for your specific setup if you're not using the exact same components that I'm using here. But because I install siege techs only, I've done so many, I know that they work every single time just because the tolerances are so um, consistent. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my step gear. So I know there's a 0.1 on the bottom of the bevel. So I'm just gonna go add 0.1 to that, which is 0.2. Okay, so now we're gonna take the 0.2, drop it on the bottom, and then install it to here. So a couple things to look out for. Uh, number one is making sure that the step gear isn't low or too low to where it's smacking or rubbing on the bottom of the shell. And the other thing too is if you have bushings or bearings, sometimes they don't sit perfectly flat in the gearbox shell and we wanna make sure that the uh, spur or the step gear is just high enough to clear that. So. We can do a free spin here, and we can see that it's not hitting anything. Another thing that we want to do is inspect the amount of tooth contact that um, the two that the two gears are having. So look at it from as many angles as you can. In this case, with Siege Techs, you can actually get 100% tooth contact because of the design. So. Don't be afraid to shim too high. However, there is a drawback to shimming the, the step too high. And that means the sector has to be higher. So in my preference, I like to shim the step or the uh, spur gear as low as possible without binding and while maintaining 
that tooth contact. And the reason for that is to make sure that the sector gear can be in alignment with the piston gear teeth, as well as not rub against the tappet plate. So I have a tappet plate here. So there's only a little bit of space between the gear face or the surface of the sector gear before it starts rubbing on the tappet, okay guys? So if we shim too high, it's gonna start rubbing there. And I'm just gonna take this old piston here. If we shim too high, the sector gear will not pick up the teeth and it'll actually possibly hit the body. So what I mean by that is, we can see there, um, it'll start hitting this top piece of the body here. And don't worry about this guys, this is a throwaway piston. Um, okay. And I actually shim both the step gear and the spur gear at the same time. So I know that there's a point two on the bottom of the step gear. So again, I'm just gonna add point one on top of that. So it's just easy math guys. I like to add point one increments to each gear. And that usually gives me the correct amount of space. Okay, so now I have that point three. We're gonna go there. Cool. So everything's free spinning and the little um, scratchy noise that you hear is just because everything is dry guys. So once you lubricate everything, it's gonna smooth up. Um, the next part is to shim the tops of the gears. And again, this is all by feel. I'm just gonna add 0.15 mm's to each one. And we're gonna start from there. Close everything up. So I can audibly hear a tiny gap with the sector gear. And with the spur gear, actually, I like to go from the bottom and check here as well. So there's a bit of play in both. And if I shake, I can hear it as well. The gears are bouncing up and down. I'm gonna just keep adding in small increments until we get the right amount of play. And add a point one here. And also to make sure guys, when we're adding the shims on top of each other, we wanna make sure that they sit nice and flat against each other because sometimes they can, again, not be perfectly flat. So we wanna make sure that we're putting two of the most flat surfaces together on another. And then I'll add a point one to this one as well. Okay. And when I tighten the gearbox, I go in a cross pattern. It's just an old habit to make sure that we're applying even pressure. Um, just a good, good habit, guys. Okay, so there's still a bit of play. We eliminated all of the play in the sector gear. Now what we need to do is eliminate the play in the step gear and we should be good to go. Yeah, there's still a bit there. Okay, so another point one. Okay, much better, much better. I'm feeling here with my hands as I turn the gears to see if there's any rubbing or if it's catching on anything, but no, it feels pretty good. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna rotate the gears with my finger here and see if it's catching or rubbing or binding on anything. So what I'm checking for is to see how smooth everything cycles. And everything is, is very, very smooth as I rotate fully throughout the stroke of the gears. And you can also check the free spin. And we can see that the gears like to spin very freely. And it's a little noisy right now, uh, typically it's much quieter than this. I think on one of the shims there might be a tiny little burr, so I can inspect that after, but once everything is lubricated, uh, it'll be good to go. So, there you have it guys. A perfectly shimmed gearbox. Let me know what you guys think. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot me a message or drop it down in the comment section below. 
looking forward to what you guys are thinking of this first video. Uh, there's going to be definitely more to come. I just don't know exactly what I'm going to uh, push out next yet. So if you guys have any suggestions, definitely let me know. Thanks, guys. See you next time.